collaboratively with Philip Clinicals, focusing on strategizing and quality improvement. I hope now we have a clear idea about Nurse Informatics working scope. Our thanks and appreciation for the EHS Nurse Informatics teams and the special appreciation to the team who worked on creating this video. Thanks to Amjad, Mi'ad, Khulud, Dua, and Rishma, along with all other nurses who helped us in developing this video. You are our future and we are really proud of you. Now allow me to welcome Professor Silva, Dean of Nursing College in Gulf Medical University, who will be monitoring the first session for today's webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Gulf Medical University, once again, a warm welcome to all those who are on the webinar, especially our students, our faculty from all the universities and friends from EHS, very especially all our speakers who are waiting for to share their knowledge with us and other well-wishers. Uh, it's actually an honor for Gulf Medical University to, to co-host this webinar along with Emirates Health Services, especially on a very vital topic like this in today's scenario for taking care of patients. And uh, I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Sumaya Mohammad al Blushi, the Director of uh, Nursing Services at uh, EHS, uh, for considering and also trusting us and their team to work along with them and uh, especially to our, uh, our uh, chancellor who actually promotes and it motivates us to do anything that comes on our way with passion and also with commitment. So I sincerely appreciate all our speakers, international speakers who are waiting, some of them even an early hour because to accommodate our timing. I apologize for the few delays that we've had, but we are going on into the webinar. Today, I'm really privileged to moderate the first session for us. We have two speakers. In between, we have another event where we'll be having a case scenario being shared from the Emirates Services. So um, students, you are welcome to write your questions on the chat box after their sessions. And then you, can, you will be uh, answered at the end of these two sessions. So permit me to introduce the first speaker this morning, uh, this afternoon. Our first speaker is Dr. Theophanes Fortis, uh, who is going to share on recent trends and ethical issues in digital nursing. Uh, may I introduce the speaker and I invite him after that to take over the session. Dr. Fortis is a principal lecturer at School of Health Sciences and an associate director outreach research center for secure, intelligent and usable system in the University of Brighton in UK. He's actually a frequent visitor to Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia as a visiting lecturer and consultant and respectively has a strong network of collaborators nationally and internationally, both within his research field and the disciplines of computing and engineering. He is the academic lead of the Brighton and Hope Digital Health Living Lab, UK, where citizens, health professionals and industry are working side by side on health innovation through co-creation. So in 2018, for his commendable work, he was named as one of the top 50 healthcare IT leaders in Europe by the Health Information and Management System Society, HIAMS Europe, the largest IT membership organization in the world. 
And he says, research interest lies in the intersection of healthcare and digital technologies. And his focus is on field of co-producing, evaluating digital health technologies through digital health living labs and accelerating innovation. He's an active member of international bodies and committees, and he has an extensive experience of acting as evaluator for national and international funding bodies. He also acts as an external evaluator for higher education quality assurance organization. So you can see that we've got the app person this afternoon to speak to us on digital health, my students, as well as faculty. So let's hear him. I'm sure we're going to draw a lot of insight from this session. Dr. Fortis, please. Professor Selva, thank you very much. And I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Sumaya and Professor Hamdi for this very honoring invitation to be with you uh, today from UK, which uh, surprisingly it's a sunny day today here in UK. Usually it's cloudy and rainy. So uh, with no further ado, let me share my uh, presentation. So, um, Just going back to our fundamental of uh, what we learned as nurses and how we were trained, we were all had in mind that um, the human touch is fundamental for nursing um, practice. This interaction between humans, it's very, very important element. And then as uh, Professor Hamdi just uh, mentioned earlier, um, this has happened. You know, this little guy here, which is so tiny that we cannot see it only under the microscope, managed to lock us all in our, our homes and put pressure to our healthcare systems. And these human touch that we've seen in the previous image became something like that. And one of the biggest debates that we have now in UK and I guess globally is how the future of nursing or healthcare profession will look like Will it be more like that and less with uh, human touch? My opinion is that we can uh, take advantage of these technologies and we can make these human touch enhanced rather than miss it. And um, as I said, um, talking about digital nursing, I would like to share with you, you know, a bit of history. It was like six years ago, as you can see, when I was preparing to introduce this term that I coined in order to describe the everyday nurse, registered nurse, healthcare assistants, that they would be working next to the patient without specific specialty, but with the skills and the knowledge of using technologies in their everyday practice. And that journey started, as I said, back in 2015. What was the hypothesis that I uh, stepped on to make this announcement about and talk about digital nursing and how this new workforce of nurses in the future should look like? As you can see, back in 2003, there was this theory of diffusion of innovations written by Everett Rogers, where he described that this is how the society is being divided in terms of innovation, adaptation of technology. So uh, as you can see, very little uh, on the left, uh, we have a small number of uh, uh, what we call them innovators. And let me use the um, uh, pointer there. So um, as you can see, innovators 2.5% only. Then we have early adapters, again, little percentage. Early and late majority is somewhere in the middle, as you can see. And then what it happens is that we have also 16% of the population that they are what we call laggards. These are the people that they will never accept change. They will never support innovation. So my hypothesis was that if we want to accelerate innovation, to accelerate adaptation of technology in the healthcare sector, which by the way, studies and research demonstrate that it has very slow adaptation and acceleration of this trans digital transformation in relation to other sectors. So my hypothesis was, what if we increase then the presence of innovators and early adapters in the healthcare sector? And me as an educator, the way to do it, it was to uh, enhance 
and educate then our future nurses on technologies. And then they take these skills when they graduate and use them in their everyday practice. That was the hypothesis of the digital uh, nursing concept. So, uh, of course, if we want to uh, look of what's happening now, uh, traditionally nursing, we know that, as I say, we would never send a nurse to the clinical field to start delivering medication if they didn't have any sessions of pharmacology in the uh, undergraduate curricula. What we have in the undergraduate curricula, we might have courses as we've seen about AI, about nurse informatics, which they talk about, you know, uh, taking this uh, specialty and becoming this uh, specialist. But what about the one random nurse that this morning needs to take care of someone's wound, needs to take care of the blood pressure measurement? How about these people? What kind of skills do we provide to them, you know? And um, another inspiration that I had and I talked about, you know, in previous conferences, it was the concept of, as I said, educating nurses for zero gravity. And where this crazy thought came from, when NASA decided to send scientists in space, they didn't say, you know how to open doors, close doors, or screw screws with your screwdrivers. You know how to do all of these skills. So you're fine then, you can go and do these in space. Actually, they knew and they realized that the environment in space is totally different from the environment on Earth. So the skills that you have on Earth, you cannot apply them there. So what they did, they replicated this environment of space, as you can see in huge swimming pools or with flights for zero gravity in order to provide this training to these people. So similarly, imagine that we are talking now about preparing nurses in the undergraduate curricula that they, at some point, they will go and they will have to do telehealth consultation. They will have to break bad news to patients through a screen. And we have experienced that. When I was talking years ago about these uh, uh, elements and these concepts, people were like surprised. Why do we really need that? You know, we, they, they can talk in person, but we have experienced, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. So what we need then, we need to develop another graduate curricula that we will provide and we will teach students about what they are going to experience in real life in the clinical field. How are we going to do that? Well, as I say, my proposal, which we have applied, you know, the last uh, couple of few years in the University of Brighton, for example, and we're talking with other universities also, is integrating this digital health education in the pre-registration curriculum. And I'm not referring to the very important element only of nursing informatics, big data, AI, but I'm referring about using new technologies to teach them, but also have three very new elements in the undergraduate curricula. Uh, teach our students about design thinking, about the concept and the mentality that when I want to take care of uh, my patient, I always need to have in my mind, the mentality of the process that I, I use or the equipment I use, they are very well prepared to pers personalize, to target and aim the specific needs of this specific patient. The other element of the undergraduate education curricula that they would be in uh, blending digital nursing, it would have to do with innovation, teaching about what innovation is, how we can innovate, give them the ability to do projects about innovation, not only essays and dissertations, and how we can achieve that. The proposal is that we can achieve it by utilizing what we have developed and what I'm directing uh, now uh, at the university, what we call them living labs. The living labs, as you can see, some photographs of the workshops that we deliver, are open innovation ecosystems, are real environments. You see it's a block of apartments. What do we do there? We run workshops with the citizens there about technologies, about digital health, about self-monitoring, about communicating electronically with their GP, general practice and doctors, with community nurses. And then we utilize these spaces for nurses to spend time in these spaces. What is the difference? The difference is that when we stand, send our uh, undergraduate students 
to the hospital to do their practice, they have to apply the skills that they learn. Skills like physical measurements, communication, administration of medication, uh, small procedures, um, electronic health records, putting the notes there. But in the living labs, what we ask our students to do is just spend time with the citizens there, not focusing on disease, but rather focusing on the skills of innovation which among others is about observing, note-taking, discussing, and coming up with ideas. And then we ask our students to come back and provide us with one business proposal or one research proposal about one challenge that they found that this citizen that they spent 10 days with, with them, they can resolve. So we're talking about a totally disrupted uh, way of applying what we call clinical placements for the students. So, um, and as we said, and Professor uh, Selva mentioned, um, the other part of the talk would be about the recent trends. Uh, we heard about some of the technologies for, from Professor Hamdi, and we already had applied electronic health records. We already had applied um, electronic monitoring in the hospital. So. I've, this, uh, I've wanted to share with you some recent trends that they became so apparent uh, due to the pandemic and it has picked up. So um, a glimpse of what big data would look like, which is a word, for example, that we hear very often now, it is that uh, it would be probably look like that, that you can see here. So, um, and maybe uh, this one. And if you wonder what are these, these are personal data of me from my devices that I have recording my everyday life. You can see here activities, um, heart rates, and here you can see quality of sleep, um, hours of sleep. So all this data, and these are big data. We're not talking about snapshots anymore of patient's condition. I'm taking the blood pressure every half an hour. So how about the blood pressure within the half an hour? So imagine that we have this continuous monitoring. So we're not talking about snapshots, we're talking about continuous monitoring of patients. The data that we will receive, they will be so many that one of the challenges then that comes up is who is gonna manage this data? What are we going to do with this data? Yeah, this is just a glimpse of what are the current trends that we might um, experience with our patients. And imagine that the patients will come with this data, they will show you as a registered nurse, as a professional, as a scientist, and they will ask you, how am I doing nurse? Am I all right? Do I need to do something? How is my condition? You know, imagine that we need to prepare nurses to be able to answer this kind of questions. You know? Another thing that we have experienced so much during the pandemic, it is something that we used to have it, you know, uh, in some areas, especially in areas where there are remote villages or um, neighborhoods that we need to reach them. And we had it here in the UK, definitely, you know, telehealth. But what we have experienced was that at some point, one day, someone said everything goes online. And then we realized the lack of bandwidth of the Wi-Fi. We realized that the systems weren't updated because we didn't used to use them. And then we realized that once we are going to change these practice, we need to have new skills. And here I have just a cartoon to demonstrate what are the different skills that we need to give to our undergraduate nurses when and prepare them to graduate about communication through this new digital era. You know, we're not talking about how the system works, where the data are being stored, but we're talking about skills of everyday practice, you know? So uh, here we, we can see it, <laughs> the cartoon that um, there was this confusion about uh, which screen I'm using for my uh, Zoom uh, session like we have here, or which, which one I'm using for my uh, job. And we have heard and read so many funny stories about what happened in, in the meetings. And as I said earlier, how do we prepare an everyday nurse, she's practicing in a ward, that they have to break bad news to a, a, a citizen that lives 100 miles away? Oh, we got your results from your CT scan 
um, that it was a repeat CT scan after your chemotherapy. And I need now to break this news to this patient. How do we close these sessions? Do we wave? Do we smile? I mean, we haven't thought these things because we haven't done it. We haven't researched in these things. And this is where there are more opportunities for collaborative research between the professionals. Um, something that um, probably you have heard it or seen it before, we're talking about our robotic partners. Here is a project from uh, the university where uh, we use the PARO seal, which is a robotic a baby seal, um, which is a partner for patients with dementia. And why I'm mentioning that? Because when we, uh, colleagues at the university introduced that, it is you know, a wide project in many countries around the planet. When we introduced that, people were thinking like, why do we need to take the human touch away from the patients of dementia? They need the contact. And then we realized with the <laughs> pandemic and the lockdown, these patients left alone. And then imagine that we will have situations in the future more and more where we will need to use these new trends of care, which is in this case robotics, in order to provide this support to our patients. Very, very important. And of course, all the challenges that are coming with it. If it works, who is going to um, uh, fix it if it doesn't work? What is the problem with the infection control? we need more research. So I'm giving you more thoughts and opportunities to think about where the future is going based on the uh, current trends in digital nursing. Not to mention, of course, artificial intelligence, where mainly we talk about systems, frameworks, platforms, algorithms that they will help us to take decisions. Uh, there is a big debate about the ethics around it, and I will refer to ethics later on. And the, the issue here is that at some point, we realized that in order to have the test of the blood sample, we put this blood sample on the machine, and the machine tells us how many white and red blood cells there are in this sample, and we trust it. Similarly, we haven't reached at this level because we need to validate the results, but artificial intelligence is a huge trend. We are already using it in hospitals without even realizing it. When we take, for example, physical measurements, we put these on our tablet. The tablet gets the results, make the calculations. It gives you a score. And also the system decides if this course needs to be escalated to the appropriate team. Very simplistic approach to AI, but it's already here and it's happening. But again, I'm talking to you about current trends that they bring also many ethical challenges and questions and issues that we will discuss in a second. So as I said, there are initiatives happening uh, around the planet that they relate to education. Not, um, I already mentioned what's happening in our university. Uh, I'm using examples from UK of uh, campaigns, every nurse and e-nurse from the Royal College of Nursing. The NHSX, which is the commissioning body for digital health and digital NHS in UK, which they're looking about the competencies that people need to have in the future for nurse informatics. And I'm sure our pre prestigious um, colleagues, they will talk about later. We have the technology informatics guiding education reform in from HIMSS. And so there are organizations out there that they look at these um, uh, initiatives. I talked to you about um, the digital nursing and how we can develop it. What we need to have in mind is that at the moment, we are looking mainly on um, practices that they have to do with leadership levels, with management levels. And as I keep saying with my uh, digital nursing theory is that we might need, and we definitely need the generals, and the officers when we go to a battle, but we need to have trained soldiers also. So we need to have the excellent specialists in nursing informatics where they will guide the workforce. But at the same time, we need the digital nursing, which is everyday nurses working in the front line where they need to have the skills to fight this battle to enhance the care utilizing digital health. So, um, as I said, 
just being aware of the time also. Um, as I said, we have ethical issues for bad and for good. Ethical issues are coming with the um, presentation of any new technologies, of any changes. And any change in every sector brings new challenges, especially in healthcare, where we have to do with human beings, the ethical issues are very, very important. Uh, the challenge with uh, the ethical issues in healthcare is that the developments of digital health technologies is so fast, it's so rapid, it changes every day. So we're trying to catch up with ethical issues that we have introduced with the initial devices, uh, smartphones, mobile health, e-health, wearable devices now. We're talking now about artificial intelligence, about systems that they will take decisions or support our decisions. And the uh, um, development runs so fast that we are trying to follow. You know, And as an example, in a recent paper from last year, you can see here evolution of ethical issues. So uh, I'm not gonna go and read all of them, but as you can observe there, what's happening from 2017 to 2020, you can see the wording in the ethical aspects on the right side of the slide. You can see in the wording that we started about equality, service availability, then we went to networking, doctor-patient relationship. In 2020, papers started um, talking about predictive diagnostic uncertainty. That wasn't exist in 2017, but it has been only three years. And the whole terminology about ethical issues in healthcare is rapidly changing. That is a challenge by itself, you know, which means that we need to be ahead of these changes. We need to prepare our nurses to be ahead of this or be aware and alert to follow up what's happening. And then the main um, terminology about ethical issues, which cover all these privacy, autonomy, accountability. And we reach then to most recent ones where we start talking about relationship of data, data democracy, transparency, explainability, which has to do with artificial intelligence and how much people understand that. So these are how the ethical issues in digital health evolved the last few years. If I go further back in the literature and I would show you if I had the time, because I can talk about digital nursing for hours, but I'm sure you wouldn't like that. So we, we could see much more difference in this terminology. We could easily observe how these things have changed. So talking about the specific, very directly related ethical issues with our uh, nursing practice. These are, I would say, the top five, because in the literature, you can find them broken down in smaller categories. So we have the ethical issue of privacy, or these first line can be broken down in each one of these elements. Privacy, confidentiality, security of personal health care. Second one is equality of access to healthcare services, accountability, effectiveness of patient empowerment, and quality of healthcare information. So, just touching in the last few in the last few minutes, I have uh, each one of these elements: privacy, confidentiality of the patient. For us, as healthcare professionals, it was easy to think that my patients' data are in this board in this closet, they are locked, as you can see on the right, with my locker, I have the key, I know that they are safe. Where are these data today? Sometimes if you ask now and you do a survey to your healthcare professionals, go to the hospital, ask a nurse who is at this morning taking blood pressure of the patient, ask them, where are your, these patients data being stored? They don't know not because it is their fault or something, or maybe they should know, maybe they should be aware, but now the data might be in the cloud and the cloud server might be based in another country, in a private company, you know? Now, unfortunately, we might move around with data in our mobile phones or the iPads that we take back to our home, being connected in the Wi-Fi of our patient, uh, of our home big, big ethical 
challenge and issue, you know, about privacy and confidentiality of the patient in terms of the patient consents after we ask them as nurses to consent to share their data for their care. But how about their consent for data that they will be used five years later for research purposes, 10 years later for the research purposes. I was reviewing an application for a project for a big organization recently where it was about AI and the statement was that um, the data will be used from data sets that they have happened in other projects. You know, do we know if these patients knew back then, five years ago, what sharing their data actually means? You know, big, big ethical issue. And we're not talking about from a law perspective, if it is right or wrong here. I'm just putting on the table the ethical issues that are coming up in the digital nursing. The second one, as we said, it, it was access to healthcare services, yeah? And we're talking about what you will see in the literature as digital gap or digital divide. If someone is, has an illness, they can take a taxi, a bus, they can be moved from someone relative next of kin to the hospital and the hospital will take care of them. But, and it wasn't a big issue, we can even send the ambulance. How about introducing all these teleconsultations to all the population as it happened in the pandemic? And then we realized that this digital divide and gap, which it was present in the literature for years, it was a reality. We realized that not everybody can access it. Not everybody has the knowledge to use the computer. Not everybody has access to Wi-Fi. Not everybody likes to use it. So imagine, what are we going to do about these patients? How are we going to treat them? Are we going to force them to use them? Are we going to force them to get a Wi-Fi? Or um, should we allow them to have the option? Questions again, that they are being raised as ethical issues. Accountability, needless to say that especially with um, devices or technologies like artificial intelligence, and here again, the cartoon is in this direction where we're thinking like, uh, yeah, well, if the device takes the decision or if the device helps me to take the decision, but the decision at the end is wrong, who's, who is accountable? You know, is it the people that they made the, uh, the AI? Is it the people that they made the algorithms, the data sets? Is it only me that I have the final decision? Who is accountable? I'm opening brackets here. Who is accountable when we have a driverless car hitting a, a, a pedestrian? You know, imagine this debate being in healthcare. Yeah. So huge, huge ethical issue. Uh, empowerment of the patient. Uh, we talk about it every day. We see it in the literature. It is actually one of the um, big, big, um, subjects of one of uh, the European projects that I have the pleasure to uh, leading one of the work packages, the Empower Care project, which it has to do about exactly exploring what are the ethical challenges when we talk about empowerment of patients and why should we think about it or why should we worry about it? empowerment is a good thing. Of course it is. But have we thought if we empower the patient, do we put big burden on them? Do we increase their anxiety? Do we put some accountability to them that they should know about data? Imagine the photograph I showed you about the mobile application where people have all this data. Um, what if we induce anxiety and frustration to these people when we're asking them to learn about all this data and empower themselves to take care of their own health? This is a huge, again, ethical issue. Empowerment is good. We need to explore and we're trying to do that with this European project, for example. There are many projects happening around the globe. What actually empowerment means and how it, it needs to be meaningful for the citizen, for the patient, without putting big burden on their shoulders. And I, I will close with um, a positive thing after we followed all these uh, challenges. Uh, when we, uh, every time in human life, when we start talking about new technology, there is always the fear that we will lose jobs, that someone will replace us. There was the introduction of the Da Vinci surgical system there. 
as you can see, there are still, and we know that there are still people working the operating theaters, even when we have the robot there. And there might be this fear that we might be replaced by the robotic nurse maybe, and we will lose our jobs. But I'm optimistic because as you can see, even in Star Trek, which it is thousand years ahead, when they had to do an operation in the Enterprise spaceship, you can see there is always there a surgeon uh, and a nurse. So um, I'm very optimistic. And I mean, it might matter a bit if it is, but we need to enhance and take this human touch from that to that. And I think it will be fine as long as we use the technologies for our advantage and as a tool. And with that, I conclude my presentation today about the digital uh, nursing, and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much, and I will stop sharing it now. Thank you. excellent session and for the way you passionately took us through this session and i'm sure everyone would appreciate that you know if you had more time you will share much more with us so i just want to say this is one among the many thank you so much um i just want to also ask our students and our faculty and all those who are part of the session if you have questions please post them on the question answer section and not in the chat box so that we can ask the speakers to answer so everybody can see it so that we can save a little bit of time from the question answer session because we are running a bit late. Now we are actually going to have a session that is going to be done by uh, our Emirate Health Services Informatics team. Uh, it's going to be a use case nursing project shared with us by this team. Uh, they have been carrying out an informatics project which has commenced in 2018 and it's been continued into a higher level now among patients on fall prevention and safety program. And this is going to be presented by Ms. Kulud Khalid Kamis. I tried to pronounce her, learn to pronounce her name properly this afternoon, who's a registered nurse who works at the Nurse Informatics at Emirate Health Services in Kuwaiti Hospital in Sharjah. She has done her Bachelor in Nursing from RAC Medical Health Sciences and has 14 years of uh, experience in medical and cardiac patient care, as well as the endoscopy unit as a unit manager. Uh, she's been acknowledged and awarded the prestigious Health Award for being the distinguished nurse. So we're really proud to have her this afternoon to share the project with us. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And it's my pleasure uh, to be with you here uh, today. Yeah, today I'm going uh, to take you uh, a walk through a project in nurse informatics, uh, which is about fall prevention pre uh, program. So in this presentation today, I'm going to outline uh, and highlight the role of the nurse informatics team in the fall prevention and safety program uh, project implementation. Fall occurs in approximately 3% of hospitalized patients. Over 20% of falls results to injuries. Most of the falls are preventable. At EHS, we uh, dig down into the gaps and problems and opportunities we have in our organization. And we found that we have some policies and procedure gaps we identified, and we have some lack of resources. And we found that we have some system design need to be uh, integrated and uh, re-modified and redesigned. Uh, that is linked to the documentation. As well, we found that we don't have a, a generated automatic report, electronic one, that can give us a clear data about the full incident rates and numbers in our organization. So by identifying these problems and gaps at our organizations, we felt that we need to, pro to uh, initiate the full prevention and safety program. And the program goal was 
to promote patient safety by implementing a standardized process to assess fall risk, as will apply measures to effectively reduce fall risk. So, EHS launched the fall prevention and safety program built based on an evidence-based quality research from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, EHQ, as well referring to the policies and procedure available at EHS. That consider the patient needs based on the fall risk levels and the appropriate measures to be taken to prevent fall. And this has been included in patient electronic medical record following the appropriate uh, design process. So EHS launched the fall prevention and safety program based on evidence-based quality, uh, as I mentioned before, and the nurses info and the nurse informatics were involved in the brainstorming session to, intru to introduce the change in the workflow, documentation, policy review, design proposal, validation of the new documentation and the new design, and uh, using a test domain, as well. Uh, and this all uh, in order to have the final design approval implementation of the fall prevention uh, programs. So the fall prevention program, we uh, have three steps uh, in this uh, program. I will just take you uh, uh, very fast uh, about uh, to talk about this program. So to start with the screening and identifying the patients who are at high risk, then based on the high risk level, we will be taking the nurse should take an action. Then the action which will lead us to reduce the risk of patient fall, following a full prevention protocols. So the first step that we design it on the system that we need to screen and identify the patients who are at risk. So a form which is the most for risk form, it has been implemented and uh, applied in the system in which the nurse, she will um, uh, start selecting or doing the patient assessment on admission. And then will, she will repeat this admission as per the patient level of score and in a specific situation, which is identified as well in the policy. So these levels were, uh, it's the low risk fall, which is from zero to 24, and the moderate risk fall if the score is between 24 to uh, 25 to 44, and the high risk for fall if the fall risk is more than or equal to 45. So the action that should be taken, it's been identified as well in our fall prevention protocol for the low risk, moderate, and high. So for example, if the nurse is selected the most for risk score uh, as per the assessment tool, this will automatically uh, pop up or will open a window, automatic window that will uh, indicate for the nurse to select from the uh, intervention that is uh, open for her. So this will allow the nurses to mandatory select the intervention that is applied or the protocol, the fall prevention protocol that is applicable to her patient based on the fall prevention level. So the nurses will not forget any of these elements because it's all listed for her. So all it will be implemented, which is applicable for the patient at the same time. So the take action for moderate risk, it will be the same as per the prevention protocol. So the same, when the nurse is doing the full risk assessment, this will uh, pop up a window for the prevention protocol for the moderate risk, as well for the high risk, it's the same. When the, when the uh, full risk prevention assessment uh, is a high risk, another intervention as per the full prevention protocol for high risk, it will pop up for the nurse for the uh, appropriate selection and implementation of the intervention. Reduce risk. In order to reduce the risk, the nurses, they need to do the full, the full risk reassessment at a specific situation. As we say, the nurse will do the full risk assessment on admission, and this needs to be repeated following a patient fall, every shift. When there is a change in the patient clinical condition, for example, after administering uh, sedative uh, uh, medication, or for example, after a specific procedure in OT, or upon a patient transfer. So to reduce the risk, we need the nurse need to reassess the patient, and this form was not available in the system. So we implemented or we designed the same form of the uh, uh, most for risk assessment to be an interactive view. So the nurse can do reassessment after admission for the nurse whenever applicable as per the identified situations. So if the score is low, again, this will pop up a window with the standard for prevention protocol for the low risk. If it's moderate, 
as well the moderate risk uh, score for prevention protocol will pop up for the nurse to select the same as will be uh, for the high risk but what if the patient fall we found that in the system we don't have this in a designed uh, form so there was no form uh, to uh, indicate for the nurse or for the multidisciplinary team that this patient already had a fall at specific day or a specific time in the uh, hospital and what is the result or the outcome of this uh, fall what is the action of the nurse did the patient had injury uh, or did not have an injury. So based on this uh, identified gaps, we modify the policy and as will be proposed and introduced a new uh, form designed in the system, which is the post fall evaluation form in which the nurse, if there is an patient fall, post the fall, she will be doing the post fall evaluation assessment. Yes. And for the purpose was for this fall uh, prevention um, uh, assessment is to capture the incident of fall that is being uh, uh, happened in the organization. So from this uh, from this assessment, this will be captured in a, a report, electronic report that will assist the team uh, to capture the cases and uh, based on this to develop an action plan. So the nurse informatics were requested and proposed the requirement and specification for an electronic report uh, generated to capture all the incident in nursing department that assisted nursing leaders to detect all full incident and provide the immediate action uh, plan to prevent patient fall in future. So the nurse informatics were involved in the process of ensuring that data is correct, reliable, complete and relevant for the given requirements. So that's all about the uh, fall prevention protocol. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kulut, for that wonderful presentation of the project that has been taken out by Emirate Health Services. And we hope that we will be able to see more of your activities as uh, you move forward and that we can share with you as well. We really appreciate the work that you do. And our second session this afternoon, uh, as part of the first uh, session, is by our speaker, second speaker, Dr. Victoria Chaisi, uh, who's going to speak on the impact of nursing informatics specialization on nursing profession and healthcare system. Um, I just want to uh, request our, both our speakers who have spoken in the first session to please attend to the questions that are uh, asked by our students as an answer so that others as well can learn from it. Thank you so much for doing it so that we can save a little bit of time. And if there is time at the end, we can take more questions. So doc, may I introduce her? Dr. Tiasi is the Director of Research Science at New York Presbyterian Hospital and Assistant Professor of Health Informatics at Vale Cornell Medicine in New York in USC. Her expertise ranges from leading electronic health recording implementations, leveraging patient-generated health data to mentoring digital health startups. Dr. Tiasi serves on the boards of Alliance of, for Nursing Informatics, American Medical Informatics Association, AMAI, Health, and chairs the Healthcare Information and Management System Society, HIMSS Nursing Informatics Committee. She was appointed as the informatics expert to the National Academy of Medicine's Future for Nursing 2030 Committee to envision the nurses' role in using technology to tackle disparities, promote health equity, and create healthier communities. She completed her BSN in the University of Virginia, MSN at Columbia University, and her doctoral degree from Utah. So you can see that we have another expertise who has taken nursing informatics as a specialization. So I'm sure her talk is going to be a personal journey and experience, and maybe some of our students in the future will take this as a specialization. Dr. TSC, please. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Selva, for that warm welcome. Whoops, I'm getting a sharing pause. Let me see. Are we all set there? Hopefully we are good. All right. 
Oops. Uh, terrific. So it is a real pleasure to be with you all today. And hopefully, uh, as Dr. Selva mentioned, I am speaking to a few of the next generation of informatics nurses. Uh, so I'll begin today by setting the stage uh, for nursing informatics, uh, talking a little bit about the types of roles and titles and the skill set uh, required. Um, then I'll talk briefly about my journey, my current organization, and some of our real world examples. And that last one about uh, falls risk was uh, spot on. That's a terrific example of using uh, nursing expertise with data to make a real difference in patient care. So congratulations on that. Um, and then finally, I'll finish up with a little bit about the future of nursing informatics. Great. Um, so I'd like to begin by grounding this talk um, on what I like to call is the nexus nature of nursing informatics. Um, so as you can see here, it's really an interdisciplinary field. So it deals with data and information um, and the knowledge related to health systems. Um, however, it really draws on the scientific theories and methodologies from a variety of domains. So from the computer sciences, uh, psychological, social, and behavioral sciences. So it's where these basic informational sciences and an application domain meet. So that application meaning the technology. Um, so in sum, nursing informatics is really using uh, the science of data to improve human health. Um, and in essence, allows us to deliver uh, better care and also promote uh, public health. And then getting specifically into the official defini definition or the definition that uh, we use in uh, my organization. So it's integrating nursing information and knowledge with those technologies, just as I mentioned, uh, to promote the health of people, families, and communities. So really getting in that community aspect. Uh, so again, taking all of these data uh, derived from our technologies that you heard earlier from Dr. Theo, got a lot of great innovative technologies, but now how can we leverage all of those data in our nursing practice? Uh, so until recently, nursing informatics has actually been one of the lesser known specialties, even though it's officially been recognized as a nursing specialty for over 30 years. Uh, but I think as we are seeing uh, the digital transformation of society as a whole, nursing informatics is becoming increasingly important. Uh, so I am super excited about that. Uh, so moreover, nursing informatics is really a systematic approach uh, to the acquisition of uh, data and information in healthcare. Uh, so the tools are, or as I say, should be secondary. Uh, and the emphasis is more on the information management. So how do we use uh, data and create meaning? Uh, and then what it's not, I like to say, it's not just about health professionals using computers or using an electronic health record, um, or it's not simply the analysis of large data sets, and it's not defined by people in circumscribed roles. So it's a lot more than that. Again, it's really applying that data and information to our nursing practice. And then also to understand uh, the mission of the informatics discipline, I'm also guided by this fundamental theorem. Um, and I really like uh, this photo here because I think it, it says a lot. Uh, so uh, essentially this uh, theorem stipulates that a person working in partnership with an information resource um, is better than that same person unassisted, right? So we can see the, the brain plus the computer greater than, than just the brain alone. Um, so this is uh, certainly applicable in healthcare, in our research, education, and particular in our decision-making activities. Um, so in theory, nursing informatics should help nurses in making better decisions. So now transitioning a bit to the informatics uh, nurse and roles and or titles you might see. Um, so depending on where he or she works 
um, or the role, an informatics nurse can have various titles. So you may hear, uh, actually, uh, across the world, you may hear a term such as nurse informaticist, clinical informaticist, uh, clinical systems analyst, informatics nurse specialist, um, or as you see here, and what I am gonna be using throughout this presentation is really informatics nurse um, is what we hear most often. Uh, so in addition to those various titles, um, as you can see here, there are many roles that the informatics nurse may assume. Um, so within a health, healthcare setting, uh, we have found many roles that exist and they are both uh, within the hospital or they may extend towards outside the hospital or clinic walls. Um, so in my organization in particular, we have nurse informaticists that are doing project management, that are working in quality, that are working on decision support activities, um, researchers, analysts, you name it. And right up at the top there, we actually do have one of our nurses that has gone on to uh, form his own uh, digital uh, informatics company. So uh, a lot of different directions. And I think as you explore informatics, you might find a certain area um, that speaks to you and that you are most interested in. And then I saw some questions in the chat about the skill set. Um, so I think the interesting part about nursing informatics that it leverages a lot of skills that nurses already have. Um, so it's uh, it's being uh, organized, and as we heard from the last example, it's being problem solvers. So the nice part is it's leveraging uh, those skills and then adding. Um, so uh, here you can see the skill set is uh, quite specialized, um, but you already have some of these also from a technical perspective. Um, so it's the technical and project management skills. Um, it's an interest in analyzing and strategizing and thinking um, about how to use data in different ways, um, understanding the cost benefits or the economic components of technology, um, as well as advocating for nurses in the implementation of health IT tools. Um, and most importantly, I believe it's a real deep understanding of how to apply technology to clinical workflows and really bridging that gap. Um, so that's how I think about it. And as I started in my role, it was how could I connect our technology folks in the hospital with the clinicians? So how could I serve to bridge that um, with my skills? Now moving on to a little bit about the work settings. Uh, so the uh, HIMSS uh, 2020 Nursing Informatics Workforce Survey found that over two thirds, um, so 68% of the over uh, 1400 survey uh, responses from nurse informaticists uh, work for a hospital or multi-facility health system. Um, so I think this is uh, pretty telling that uh, the health systems need nurse informaticists. And the thought is also that this might correlate to the increased value um, that informatics brings to a health system in supporting goals and achievements. Uh, so I think that is also an important piece, um, getting back to that advocacy note, uh, having nurse informaticists at leaders in the organization to show that value um, that nurses, nurse informaticists bring to the table. Uh, so now I'll talk briefly about my uh, journey and segue into a couple examples uh, from my own organization. Um, so I like to say that uh, for nursing informatics, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, so I was actually working in nursing education at the time, um, you know, over 15 years ago uh, when our hospital transitioned from paper to electronic records. And um, I immediately uh, recognized the value of having all of these data uh, digitized and, and in our computer systems. Uh, so I was immediately intrigued and wanted to learn more. Um, so from there, uh, I went on to obtain my master's in informatics. I actually did that part-time while I continued to work full-time. And I thought that was important for me because as I was learning about informatics, I was able to apply it while I was working at the same time. 
Um, and then upon graduating with my master's, I actually uh, moved into our IT department. Uh, we had a uh, uh, chief information officer of our hospital at the time who also happened to be a nurse. And she was very forward thinking and realized that she needed nurse informaticists to, as I uh, just mentioned, serve as that bridge. So she said, I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna do this. Do you mind if uh, you uh, come take a chance and, and we can figure this out together? Um, and I really received a, a rich hands-on experience of all areas uh, within IT. And it really helped me uh, to learn more about uh, this area and also to connect uh, with the clinicians in new ways. Um, I then later uh, went on to uh, get my PhD in nursing informatics to pursue research. So my area of research is how we can leverage patient-generated health data. And as Dr. Theo had nicely shown, there's so much data that our patients are generating. And how can we bring that into the clinical environment uh, to reduce the documentation burden of our nurses? And um, I also now teach uh, one course a year in a graduate health informatics program, which is a nice way to introduce uh, new informaticists, hopefully like yourselves, to the field. Um, so there are many directions to go with nurse informaticists. There certainly isn't just one path. Um, and I know my journey has taken me to uh, you know, various places and I know there are more on the horizon. So I think finding again, what you, what you are interested in in the informatics world and um, you know, learning more about it and you know, continuing to apply that to your practice. Uh, but now a bit onto my current organization. So uh, New York Presbyterian is a very large academic medical center. Uh, we have a wealth of data uh, that is ready to be used. So there is a lot of work to do in informatics. Uh, we actually have informatics colleagues that are on the university side as well as the hospital side. Uh, so a lot of collaboration that goes on. Uh, so next I'd like to describe a few projects that uh, were led uh, by informatics nurses in the organization. Uh, so the first one here is um, auto texting in the operating room. Uh, so in talking with our nurses, we encountered uh, an issue where the family members were very anxious about their loved ones in surgery. And they were constantly trying to find out the status. They were trying to call nurses in the operating room. They were you know, calling the nurses in the pre-op area. Um, and we realized that um, this took a toll on our nursing staff. And, uh, you know, recognizing this need, we worked very closely with our users. Uh, so meaning uh, examining the workflows of our operating room nurses and our pre-op area nurses. And we designed a solution to support the families, um, ensuring that we aligned with those regular workflows. Um, so uh, what we have here is uh, a, an auto texting program that actually launches directly from our electronic medical record. Um, so as the nurse is documenting the patient going into the next stage uh, of their uh, operating room journey, uh, those texts uh, automatically flow uh, to the family members, providing they give us a cell phone number uh, when they arrive uh, to the hospital. So this uh, really has, uh, again, supported our nurses and uh, aligns with their workflows. Uh, it has increased satisfaction of both our nurses and our patients. So we consider this a big success story. Uh, the second one I'll move to here is the uh, journey to an electronic unit or what we call the I unit. Uh, so this was something we came up with as a contest, if you will, um, in that for one year, uh, you know, any unit that applies to this program, uh, we will, uh, for that full year, uh, create a patient care unit of the future. Um, so the staff uh, were provided training on how to think differently. Uh, you heard earlier about design thinking. So that's actually uh, what we use with some of our partners called What If. 
So we trained uh, all of our staff for that particular unit that uh, one, uh, it happened to be, as you can see here, our burn unit. They were uh, the, the winners of the one year uh, unit of the future. And, uh, but it was really uh, the nurses that were driving the technology to improve the patient experience. Um, they came up with ideas. We created a room where they could all do brainstorming. Uh, we implemented various projects such as using smartphones to capture wounds um, and treatments in real time. Uh, that's especially important with our, our burn cases. Um, and then uh, we created a way for those photos to be automatically uploaded and integrated within our electronic medical record. Um, we had bedside patient tablets implemented so that patients could call or message the nurse directly since we know that pain control is quite important for our burn patients. Um, and then we also had electronic whiteboards so that patients could see information in real time, like the names of their care team, their pain score, their falls risk, as we just heard about, um, and any upcoming treatments or procedures. So all of these projects, I, I could probably talk for a, a whole uh, lecture on this, but all of them required uh, nurses trained in informatics to support and translate the needs identified by the staff on the unit to our technical teams. Um, so this has been a you know, big win for our organization, and we're thinking about how can we do this on other units and, and scale our learnings from this. And then uh, the last uh, example I'll cover here is something called uh, Noom Health. So through a, a citywide program, um, I uh, mentored uh, new mobile health uh, startup companies um, and our hospital uh, specifically uh, was connected with, with this company, Noom Health and their National Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, that was delivered uh, through a mobile app, um, along with a digital health coach. Uh, so that's definitely a novel idea for us. Um, so by working uh, with one of our clinics, and there we go, uh, and the registered dietitians and the diabetic nurse educator, so a real collaborative effort. Again, I think nurses are so skilled at collaboration and pulling the right people together. Um, so we were able to study the usability um, of this app by the patients. We evaluated whether they would use it over time. Um, and we also uh, looked to see if we would achieve positive patient outcomes. Um, so we had tremendous success. Um, in fact, uh, we had more success using this than some of the in-person programs for preventing diabetes. Um, so we are now exploring other ways to Oops, let's see what happened there. We are now exploring other ways um, to engage patients in their care so they don't always have to travel uh, to the clinic for a visit. So now let's look to the future since I'm someone that is uh, quite interested in where we need to go and the work uh, we need to get there. Um, so pardon me for one moment. Um, Not sure why my screen is looking a little funny. All right, apologies for that, there we go. All right. So I think there are five uh, major trends and actually you heard uh, a few of them from uh, Dr. Theo already, but I think all of these will impact uh, nursing informatics. Um, so first up here, we have personalized care. So you might also hear this as precision health or precision medicine. Uh, so this is that whole idea of connected devices, uh, ways to get real-time data from patients. Uh, so I think this is uh, going to be uh, very critical moving forward. And again, as I mentioned, thinking about how we can bring these data into the clinical environment so that they're not just another data source that our nurses have to look at, but how do we introduce them in a way that it makes it easier for decisions, um, that it makes it easier to visualize the data. So I think there's gonna be a lot of work uh, to do in this area. 
Analytics, I think this is, this is a huge one. So I think there will be an increased need to provide more data to clinicians and make them actionable at the point of care. Um, so it's, again, more than just simply putting data in the hands of clinicians, but how do we really move to that information synthesis um, and integrate it into our decision support tools? Um, so we can see starting from the bottom and working our way up in this diagram, um, healthcare will become more proactive as it moves uh, from uh, the prescriptive eventually into that cognitive space. Um, so I hope to see data uh, introduced into our analytics uh, you know, that's from communities, that's from the public health sector, um, and also from our environment understanding pollutants and other environmental factors. So I think all of these uh, data elements will continue uh, to uh, contribute to uh, positive health outcomes and we'll need that informatics analysis. Um, next is uh, speech recognition. So I think this uh, runs the gamut as you can see here from virtual scribes um, all the way to the virtual assistant and chatbot approach. Um, we hope to see a proliferation of more ambient voice technologies, right? So we're no longer typing on keyboards, but we're using our voices uh, for efficiencies in documentation. Um, and very connected to this, I hope to see a greater use of natural language processing of speech in order to synthesize notes and surface data uh, from a very complicated EHR to search sometimes. Um, so I think all of this will need uh, informaticists. Uh, the fourth trend here, and again, you heard a bit about this uh, from uh, Dr. Theo as well. So this encompasses both augmented and virtual reality. Uh, so although it's really in its infancy, I think um, we are going to see a lot more in this area. Um, so there'll be an increased need for guidance during surgical procedures, mental health interventions. Um, we're already seeing uh, nurses exploring the use of virtual reality to treat pain and anxiety. Um, and then uh, last but not least, I believe the biggest promise is in the training of clinicians. Um, so in the past 20 months, we've seen some nursing schools that were not able to have patients live. Um, they're experimenting with training nurses to give injections to patients in a virtual environment. Um, so really interesting. So taking us beyond uh, some of the simulation that we're seeing today. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the trend in the use of artificial intelligence uh, from robotics. Um, so it includes using robotics for surgical procedures, um, and mostly linked to nursing, and as you saw with that great photo, is the use of the social companion robots for social isolation. So we saw this quite notably with COVID-19 um, that we helped to increase that human-to-human -human interaction amongst uh, nursing home residents and our seniors. Um, so there's really promising work there. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, as we talk about artificial intelligence, informatics must really work uh, to address health disparities in some of our algorithms. Um, so the widespread use of some of our AI algorithms to choose who gets what um, has certainly raised uh, valid and uh, difficult questions about how, how our machines make decisions and whether the decisions are in the best interest of patient care. So again, I think nurse informaticists understand this best and we're gonna need more uh, working in that space. Uh, so uh, as mentioned on the onset, uh, in May, uh, the U.S. National Academy of Medicine released its report on the future of nursing in the next decade. Um, so in this report, there are numerous recommendations related to nursing informatics. Um, so one, we must really think about those social determinants of health data and how do we improve the visualization, incorporate them into our workflows in a way that addresses health equity for all. Um, we know we must be intentional about employing more nurses with informatics expertise. Um, so this is an effort um, that the United States is taking on over the next decade. We need more uh, informatics nurses. Um, so thinking about how we uh, introduce that early on in the educational uh, settings. 
Um, we also believe that nurses must be given the ability and resources to innovate and use technology, um, especially when it comes to telehealth. And again, we've seen that uh, so glaring in the last 20 months. Uh, so in summary, I believe the future is very bright. I think uh, nurse informaticists, again, serve as that very needed bridge between technology and patient care. Um, and I think as more healthcare organizations are recognizing the potential of informatics to improve the quality of patient care, these number of informatics nurse positions are going to continue to increase. Um, so I believe that informatics is the key ingredient uh, to the disruption of health and healthcare, um, and I hope you will agree. So thank you very much for having me, and I will certainly look out for any questions in the chat. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jesse, for that um, uh, enlightening each one of us on the importance of nursing informatics and the, as a career, how we can uh, take this forward, very especially your personal experience, as well as motivating the young students uh, who are there to follow your line. And of course, as you rightly said, not only USA, everybody is going to lead uh, need more uh, nurses who are going to take the specialization nursing informatics. We really appreciate uh, for you being up early this morning to share your thoughts and your passion with all of us. Uh, before we proceed on to the session two, I just would like to ask both of you, uh, Dr. Fortis, as well as uh, Dr. Tiasi, uh, just to take two minutes uh, with any pertinent question that any of the students have asked in the question answer session that you think is so vital that can be uh, shared with everyone. And I'm sure you're going to answer them on the question answer session, but just maybe a question from Dr. Fortis, as well as a question from Dr. Uh, Tyasi. If you think anything that you thought was that's something that you would like to express. Dr. Fortis, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Tiaz, for your uh, great session. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I've received a question which it was very exciting and interesting, and which uh, demonstrates that students are really engaging with these matters. And the question had to do, um, and correct me, uh, Fahmi, if I'm wrong, the question had to do with the options that we give uh, as I said, one of the ethical issues is that we provide these services, Wi-Fi, remote consultations. And the question was, how, how can it can be an ethical issue since we still have the option to go to the hospital? Okay. And I, and I answered that, indeed, it was an excellent question. And I put an answer as a thought for thinking that isn't it an ethical issue when we give options to our population that not everybody has the ability to take on. And that presents an ethical issue by itself. It's like we're giving uh, medications that are amazing, but not everybody can access it. You know, So the moment that we give the option, but not everybody can get the option, that is an ethical issue by itself. Okay? I, I hope uh, that clarifies. Thank you. Infer. And from your slide, uh, you actually said we're trying to find every now and every new day, we are going to find ethical issues using this. So it's an excellent question and an excellent answer for all of us to think. Dr. Tiasi, do you have anything that has been asked which you would like to answer, please? Um, I don't know if you had time, you were presenting, but uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. I just took a quick look. Yeah, I think there are a couple that um, I might like to address. So I think there's one about are there any subspecializations within nursing informatics? Um, I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, so I think, again, it's understanding, you know, what sort of uh, you know, part of informatics speaks to you. So for instance, there are nurses that specialize in clinical decision support in particular. So they're very focused on, uh, again, uh, very similar to what we saw uh, with the falls risk example. How can we make sure that we provide uh, data to nurses so that they are making the right decisions? There are nurses that specialize um, in mobile health products 
um, and the consumer informatics side. So there is a discipline within informatics called consumer health informatics. So we have nurses that are very passionate about that. And I think, again, nurses as you know, the consummate patient advocate, I think, uh, and the most trusted healthcare provider, I think nurses are well suited uh, to work in that consumer health informatics space. Uh, so to understand how we can present data to patients and families in a way that they understand. Um, and then very connected to this, um, talking about uh, job prospects and how to get started. I think it's really looking for those areas that you are interested. Uh, like if quality and outcomes is something that interests you, uh, look for roles in that quality space. You might see something that's called an analyst um, and, and start uh, some of your informatics work there. Or like I said, if you're interested in the patient side, maybe look at some patient experience roles, um, things along those lines. So I think there's no you know, one perfect path. It's really about finding what interests you and bringing your informatics training and expertise to that role. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, um... She's given a wide perspective of where we can move uh, in the field of informatics. Um, for want of short of time, we are not going to take any more questions, but I request both our speakers to answer them if you find anything that is, you know, you could share. A uh, question could be to either of you, but doesn't matter. You know, our students are going to be happy in seeing and others can read it as well. So once again, I take this opportunity to thank both of you. I can see the passion in you and I'm sure you've instilled it into each of us a little bit. So thank you so much for the time. And we're going to move on to the next uh, part of the session where Ms. Farah is going to take us to the session too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke Silva, and thank you for our respected speakers for their uh, very fruitful sessions and enlightening experience. Now we are moving to our next session, starting by uh, a user experience in the nursing informatics fields. And that will be shared by Dr. Natasha Ramantel. She, she is a digital health strategist, community outcomes at HEMS organization. A registered nurse with an experience from the front lines to executive leadership, Dr. Ramantel has successfully managed multiple projects and products specializing in increasing access to healthcare via technology. Dr. Ramantel has navigated through a number of nursing and the clinical roles and that enrich her full experience and her full potential to deploy that into technology use including insurance company, health, health, uh, home health nursing, and uh, in nursing education. So Dr. Natasha, without further delays, the stage is for you to share your experience. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the introduction. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to extend a thank you to the Emirates Health Services, as well as the Gulf Medical University College of Nursing uh, and the organizers of this event and my HIMSS EMEA colleagues, as well as the professors and nursing students and my esteemed uh, speakers and panelists. I work for HIMSS, um, Healthcare Information Management um, System Society. And our vision is to realize the full health potential of every human everywhere. And our mission is to reform the global health ecosystem through the power of information and technology. So our objectives for today, I will share more about the diversity of nursing informatics and digital health. I'll also help you understand how practical nursing informatics skills are used to facilitate change management whenever introducing any type of technologies and then recognizing how HIMSS can support your careers in nursing and or in digital health. And I'll also help share um, an understanding of the digital health indicator, uh, which is a measurement tool and how it impacts care delivery and operations by establishing benchmarks for gauging uh, progress towards digital health transformation. 
So a little history about HIMSS. HIMSS has actually served the global community for the last more than 60 years. Uh, we have focused on operations across North America, Europe, the United Kingdom, and the Middle East and Asia, uh, Asia and Pacific. Uh, we also have emerging projects that are arising in Africa as well. But we are a mission-driven global nonprofit, and HIMSS offers a unique depth and breadth of expertise in health uh, innovation, public policy, workforce development, research and analytics, and so much more. But as a global advisor and thought leader, um, it's a member organization that's committed to transforming the health ecosystem. And we use a community-centric approach where our innovation engine actually delivers key insights and education and engaging events to healthcare providers, to payers, government, startups, anyone involved in the healthcare space. And our membership is vast. Our members include more than 100,000 individuals, over 480 provider organizations, over 470 nonprofit partners, and over 650 health service organizations. So HIMSS offers a variety of membership types and ways to get involved, and I can share more about that a little bit later. Um, I am what is referred to as a second career nurse. I never set out to become a nurse. I always say that nursing chose me. Uh, despite having many family members in healthcare, for example, my mother is a retired nurse administrator. She was a nurse administrator for over 40 years. Um, her four brothers are physicians. I have a sister that is a physician and one of my other sisters was, is a sterile processing manager at a local hospital. And I have a host of other family members in other aspects of healthcare, research, home health, et cetera. But when you look at my academic and professional achievements, they don't exactly align with what you would consider a nursing informaticist or a digital health professional. I have an international business degree with a minor in finance. I had a master's in African New World Studies, and I had spent a number of years in international development working um, with where, where I was the bridge between non-governmental organizations and governments, and I helped facilitate collaboration to improve countries' economic and social conditions. So I've been involved in a number of projects prior to nursing that included microenterprise, agriculture, healthcare as well, but then also some social services. And I traveled the world and I worked with a number of different people and communities and I enjoyed it. Um, although my previous career was not similar to nursing, there are a number of skills that were transferable and useful to the nursing profession that I used extensively once I became a nurse. Part of that is collaboration, uh, being the bridge, uh, and then relationship building, attention to detail, helping to break down silos, financial experience, operations, and also my global experience has helped me interact with various cultures, some of which I've had to provide care for. And then one day, my world was transformed forever. Uh, my seemingly healthy older brother died at the age of 32 from a heart condition he did not know he had. This personal tragedy actually led me to pivot my career to nursing to hopefully prevent what happened to my family from happening to other families. So I decided to return to school. I completed my Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And because I thought this would be my way of affecting a broader change and making an impact at both the population level and ultimately at the global level by caring for individuals when they were at their most vulnerable state. So I returned to school, I graduated, I took my board exams and passed. My first entry into nursing was actually working in the emergency department as a nurse. So for a person that did not like the sight of blood, this was the last place that I thought I would be. However, I loved it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love the organized chaos of the emergency department and the variety of cases I was able to see and participate in by providing care. After being in emergency department for a number of years, I felt like I was affecting change here and there, but not on a broader level like I intended to do. So I decided to explore other areas of nursing to determine where I could make the biggest impact for patients. So I then became a case manager and I've been a case manager in a hospital and I've also been a case manager outside of a hospital. I quickly realized this was not my niche. 
Uh, it worked with patients in the acute setting and preparing them to go home and ensuring that they have the necessary connections for their needs once they return to their home or another care setting similar to maybe a rehabilitation center. Um, I was also a home health nurse where I cared for nurse for patients in their home environments. Um, this was something that I did in order to keep up with my skill set as well. But I became, I also became a nursing professor. I transitioned to where I wanted to share my knowledge and teach students, much like yourselves. I thought this was a very rewarding experience, but again, I still felt the need to make a larger impact. I didn't feel like I was reaching patients and also reaching some of the providers despite preparing nursing minds to do well out there in the future. So I then became a nurse manager at a very large insurance company in the United States where I worked on the continuity of care of patients across care transitions in order to avoid any gaps in care. And I also became a certified health coach and I worked at a population health consulting firm where I trained physicians and their care teams on optimizing clinical workflows in order to improve the quality and their performance, um, ultimately leading to better patient outcomes. This was something that uh, also introduced me a bit to uh, digital health and nursing informatics because we used quite a bit of digital technologies in order uh, to train the physicians and other providers in their care teams. I, I did continue working as a bedside nurse during all these roles, whether it was in a part-time or full-time basis at times to keep my clinical skills current, but I still felt there was more that I could do in terms of making an impact. This is where my unconventional path to nursing led me to um, nursing informatics and digital health. It wasn't until one of the hospitals where I worked was transitioning from one EMR to another EMR where I became involved in nursing informatics. That was my entree through an EMR implementation. So this is not uncommon for many nurses to engage in EMR implementations and then become fascinated with the informatics and digital health. So I became what's called a super user, which you're probably familiar with, where I volunteered my time as a nurse, but I trained, I was trained on the EMR system in order to provide support to my peers. Once the EMR went live, I was the person that was side by side by my peers, providing solely support on the actual technology that was being implemented. So um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I enjoyed the learning aspect. I learned the I enjoyed the training aspect and also providing insights on how best to share this information with my peers in order for them to more efficiently care for their patients with technology. So this made an impact on me so much so that at another hospital, I volunteered again to become a super user. This was actually a bit different because this particular hospital was going from using paper documentation to an EMR. It has a bit of different nuances involved in that. But again, I had the training and education background. I knew what the super user role entailed and it appealed to me. So, and I did well at it. So that was where um, I said, a nursing informaticist actually suggested I become a consultant for EMR implementations. So then I looked into that and I started to travel to be on site to support nurses. Uh, they call it at the elbow, ATE support. Uh, I solely trained nurses on how to use the EMR um, and, and I provided them with as much information to help them streamline their new clinical workflow that now included technology. And I gained so much knowledge on the implementation process and, and provided the clinical and technical input to assist with a smooth transition that I decided to look into becoming a nursing consultant for EMR implementations. And this was from beginning to end for a number of different EMR applications. But this experience helped me learn about the implementation process where you start with the planning, you go into the requirements gathering, collecting workflows, and it's not just clinical workflows, you're collecting all workflows wherever the patient is touched. Um, after doing this for a number of years, I then became a clinical systems manager at a large physician group where I served over 11,000 physicians and nurse practitioners. I was responsible for a team that implemented and maintained both a homegrown EMR, the, the organization created their own EMR for ne neonatologists. And I also was responsible for um, implementing a vendor-based EMR for anesthesiologists 
in over 600 hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers throughout the United States. So clinical training as a nurse prepares you for a nursing informatics career or a career in digital health. You use your critical thinking skills, your assessment skills, your prioritization skills, and your planning skills. At this time, I, I think I was solidified in knowing which direction I wanted to move in terms of the nursing sphere. Uh, I knew I wanted it to include some aspect of technology, and I did move on to pursue my doctorate in health science with a focus on global health. Um, and this was because I wanted to marry my past experience prior to becoming a nurse with my healthcare experience. And my, my technology aspect was my doctoral work actually focused on the use of mobile phones as a means of access for, um, uh, for, for access to healthcare in low and middle income countries. So my extensive uh, nursing informatics and digital health experience prepared me for my role here at HIMSS. And my responsibilities here include the Community Care Outcomes Maturity Model, which is in development at the moment and will be announced at our HIMSS conference in March 22, 2022. Um, it measures the digital maturity for community-based organizations which deliver healthcare services. So focus areas are of those that are considered foundational to all healthcare organizations that when advanced, enable health organizations to build the capacity to deliver digitally enabled care and services for all care partners in care settings such as long-term care, residential care, chronic care, rehabilitation centers, primary care, behavioral health, and other community-based healthcare settings. Uh, I am also responsible for the digital health indicator, which is the most sophisticated a global digital health tool used to measure health systems capacity. This tool identifies a health system strengths and it also uncovers opportunities to inform a comprehensive digital health strategy. So the digital health indicator is a pathway to increase health system capacity and improve population wellness. And I'll share more of that in a moment. If my experience in nursing informatics and digital health has taught me anything, it is when you are introducing any new technology into the healthcare setting, it involves significant change management. And the one thing that is constant in life is change. So there is so, there is so much change in healthcare. There are new care delivery models, there are new EMRs, there are new devices, readmission reduction programs, advancing technologies, but the pace of change in healthcare has also increased dramatically. And one of the key concerns with change in healthcare is the management of change as healthcare professionals. The biggest hurdle in change management is people, believe it or not, because confused people do not move. Communication is the key. So from the very, very top, meaning C-suite, your chief operating officer, chief executive officer, et cetera, to the front lines, your patient facing employees, providers, nurses, ancillary staff, et cetera, Managing that change is about handling the complexity of the process. And this involves evaluating, planning, implementing operations, tactics, strategies, and making sure that the change is worthwhile and most important that it's relevant. Also workforce competency, I cannot stress this enough. Healthcare leaders should be concerned with managing change where healthcare professionals are obligated both to obtain and maintain the expertise needed to undertake their professional tasks within their competence. Is your workforce adequately and routinely trained to use these digital tools and technologies? These are the questions that stakeholders and, um, and leaders need to be thinking about. Resistance to change is also very difficult. Um, advocating for broad-based action among all stakeholders is essential. And it's, it's encouraging people to have to behave differently it brings a, um, ch that change forward. So clear expectations should be set for every department involved. And because even if one person resists that change, it misaligns the entire organization. So even when a healthcare organization is armed with the best evidence-based information, willing staff members and good intentions, the implementation of new digital or clinical or new operational practices still requires additional careful organizational planning. 
So once you have the appropriate tools to help you navigate through this process, you'll be better equipped to implement the change, which is sure to come because again, change is constant. But before hospital leaders can change an entire culture, because organizational change is culture change, the organization needs to be ready. A thorough assessment should be done and a clear timeline should be established. One that is realistic where you can move quickly enough to demonstrate progress because change can seem so daunting to many people in addition to the, the other tasks that they have, which the primary task is caring for their patients. And there is probably no greater change we have endured in our lifetime until the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. This COVID-19 pandemic actually hastens the need for more nurses and specifically nursing informatics and digital health professionals as we have had to dramatically and quickly shift to a virtual environment for care delivery. So today we all find ourselves very much involved in and focused on how health systems can be supported to manage within such an unprecedented time of change as the COVID-19 pandemic. This map you see is just one of the many that profiles the global spread of the infection daily. So when we consider the care processes required to manage the thousands of people affected by COVID-19, while at the same time consider all the patients that health systems provide care for who are not COVID patients, a critical consideration for all health system leaders and stakeholders is how do we plan the post-pandemic recovery? How can we take the lessons learned and mobilize digital technologies and tools and opportunities to accelerate and strengthen health system capacity and infrastructure to enable every health system in the world to strengthen their resolve, their resilience, and also their preparedness for pandemic management? Since the COVID-19 pandemic, we all have had to adjust again with limited preparedness where we've had to rapidly shift to that virtual care with limited digital infrastructure to support it. How effective is it? What does quality and safety look like in a virtual environment? What is the demand for the workforce? Many of these things are completely unknown. They're developing now or they're exacerbated. Um, not only are there challenges for managing people affected by the pandemic, but there are also very significant numbers of people managing chronic illnesses. Yet these patients are largely isolated now with few, if any, programs that can be accessed virtually during the pandemic. So the question to consider is both a challenge, and I also see this as an opportunity, leveraging the self-management tools and technologies to help people, and particularly those with chronic illnesses, with the support of virtual connection with providers whenever and wherever it is needed. So how and where are health systems connecting to people and populations at times like this when it's most needed? We live in digital societies. We're connected in real time to events and social networks around the world. Yet health systems have not yet created the meaningful connections with people and populations they're mandated, mandated to serve. This is where digital health is widely viewed as an opportunity to optimize health system performance. Today, it may offer the capacity of health systems to effectively manage pandemics. However, there is no clearly defined roadmap for health systems to guide progress. And there is a clear need for focus on transforming care delivery in order to expand system capacity to proactively manage demands for care. HIMSS is the only global network with the multi-sector reach across global health systems with a suite of maturity tools and enable implementation of digital health because digital health transformation requires a team approach. And I think it's important to make a distinction here that digital health is not simply digitizing today's healthcare. It is actually rethinking healthcare, transforming it to address health and wellness. And population health and wellness is outcomes focused. So a mature digital health ecosystem is actually designed to produce outcomes. It includes what you see here, governance and workforce. That's the foundation. It's foundational to ensure that there's data stewardship, there's privacy, security, and workforce integrity, making sure those things are intact. Interoperability, ensuring we not only capture data, but that we mobilize and enable that data to, to be exchanged across the journey of care for patients. 
analytics, whether it's predictive or prescriptive, making sure that you have the analytics because analytics transforms data into knowledge, insights and outcomes, as well as tracking those outcomes. And then the digital capacity. Individuals are meaningfully connected to providers to manage their health and wellness with the support of health teams. And it also enables providers and care teams to predict and mitigate risks. All of this encompasses population health and wellness, which again is outcomes focused. And we are working with multiple countries to collect and analyze data of highly digitally enabled health systems, looking at outcomes that are reported and profiling. What does it mean for health systems? What does this mean for populations? All of that is inclusive of the digital health space and the nursing informatics space. HIMS launched the digital health indicator, expanding on key dimensions of building digital health ecosystems. Again, it's outcomes focused. Part of that is because as Sir William Osler said, it is as important to know what sort of a patient has a disease as it is to know what sort of a disease a patient has. So the methodology was we had a critical analysis of current, the current state of evidence related to digital health. So an in-depth review of current measures, frameworks and models was done. And then a digital health framework and measurement strategy was designed, the digital health indicator. And then we pilot tested this globally across eight health systems in five countries across three continents for validation, for feedback, and also for fine tuning. What does the digital health indicator measure? Well, based on the principles and evidence of the HIMSS digital health framework, the digital health indicator measures four dimensions that are proven to help health systems advance their digital health transformation. Interoperability, the adoption of digital tools, clinician use of those secure digital tools, mobilization of data from multiple sources, the seamless flow of data across teams and organizations and populations, the rates of security alerts, automated tracking of breaches and cybersecurity, also looking at organizational outcomes, cost, compliance, accuracy, all of that is inclusive under the fundamentals of the interoperability dimension. Person-enabled health and wellness, that is the adoption and use of personalized digital tools to manage one's health and wellness. Examples like wearables, other devices, but also the effectiveness of proactive, preventive risk mitigation strategies and the use of data to segment population health outcomes in order to support the health and wellness. Predictive analytics, this is another dimension measured, using collected data to determine future outcomes. Analytics, again, proactively identifies risks and tracks outcomes, and then health and wellness care mitigates risk to keep people well. And analytics is also instrumental in the operational performance, inclusive of things like cost, quality, safety outcomes in real time for individuals as well as populations. And the last dimension is governance and workforce, developing a leadership strategy for the stewardship, transparency, policy and decision making, and workforce capacity and competency of advancing digitally enabled care delivery informed by outcomes data. So using the digital health indicator assessment, health systems essentially respond to statements across each of those four dimensions. This is just a snapshot of, the, uh, of what they would receive. But based on that virtual assessment and engagement across the organization through some in-depth interviews with key clinical and operational leadership, we usually deliver a plan that's tailored specifically to a health system needs, health systems needs and their current advancement and their goals for the future. Um, the digital health indicator has over, um, has over 100 indicators. It uses a 400 point system. And those points are also awarded um, to healthcare providers that achieve a stage six or stage seven on other HIMSS maturity models. So it's used to help drive the score as well. But the scores are used for benchmarking comparison between health systems globally. And I think that is where a lot of the um, value for health system organizations is found. So the digital health indicator can be used to set a health system's digital health transformation priorities, to build a strategy by measuring where you're starting today and looking at where, how far you have to go. It can also be used simply to identify strengths and opportunities to advance toward a digital health ecosystem. 
or it can be used to help build a business case. Maybe an organization doesn't know where to start. So you take the digital health indicator to help um, determine the health system's overall digital health transformation strategy. So this is a snapshot into my experience and where nursing informatics and digital health has taken me. I would say that you all are well positioned at the moment to explore a number of interests in nursing informatics and digital health. And I encourage you to be curious and take advantage of every opportunity to get involved, whether it is academically through degrees or certifications, professionally, or even through volunteerism. Here are a few ways that you can get involved with HIMSS. And as a global advisor and thought leader in healthcare information and technology, HIMSS understands the integral role that nurses play in the healthcare workforce. And we've worked to amplify this awareness by convening the experts and conducting extensive research on informatics and digital health, as well as other uh, health related areas. But we believe nurses are in a unique position to use technology across the care continuum, ultimately helping to bridge that gap between the clinical and technical perspectives with the patient at the center. So I encourage you again to get involved with HIMSS and make a lasting contribution. HIMSS is here to support your careers and your professional development with tools and resources for nursing students and other health-related fields um, as, and also for professionals. So if you're interested in informatics or in digital health, Here's the information on the screen. And I was also made aware that um, one of my colleagues, the um, Senior Manager for Strategic Partnerships of the EMEA region, Lloyda Leonard, informed me that she's worked with the organizers of this event and HIMSS is delighted to extend a complimentary HIMSS individual digital membership to all of the nursing students there. So I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Ramantul, for sharing your experience and uh, enlightening us about the HIMSS organization and their contribution to nursing informatics uh, specifically and in generally to the health informatics and digital transformation. As, uh, and as a nurse informatics myself going through the transitioning from uh, nursing clinical practice into nursing informatics, I truly second you in uh, stressing on the importance of having the clinical experience so you could successfully add the impact into the nursing profession through informatics solution and digital transformation. Uh, I would like to advise our attendees, please, if you have any questions for Dr. Ramantul to add it on the chat and Dr. Ramantul, if you don't mind to answer them back uh, so we the, the students and the attendees can benefit the most. Thank you. Now moving to our uh, last session of today's webinar that will be delivered by Dr. Susan Newberg. <coughs> She's a nursing informatics consultant, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, USA. She has international experience with health informatics with vendors, academia, consultation, and hospital wards. She is a fellow on the American Academy of Nursing, the HIMSS Association, and the American Mental Inform Medical Informatics Association. Her PhD from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, USA is focusing on nursing informatics. Uh, Dr. Susan is a board certified in nursing informatics and has initiated the first review course in nursing informatics in 1995. She creates and conducted the nursing informatics booth camp offered on both nursing informatics certification and continuing education. She has co-edited five books and has written over 120 publications in nursing informatics. She is awarded as HIMSS 2015 chapter leader of the year. And she's a recipient of the uh, Sigma Theta Tau International Honorary Society of Nursing 2019. And for soon she will be awarded the Saba Nursing Informatics Leadership award which is given in Washington, DC. Dr. Susan will be talking to us today about the nursing informatics certification and professional development. So the stage is yours, Dr. Susan. Thank you so much. It is good to be here. It would be better to be there in Dubai, but I'm satisfied being here. Um, and I am planning a trip to Dubai in about two years. So perhaps I will meet some of you. And this 
my introduction was just given. Thank you so much. Um, in thinking about what Dr. Tiazzi said and the question she had about the various subspecialties within informatics, I have had several roles in nursing informatics over my career. So I started as an implementer, moved into a developer of information systems, have worked as a consultant, and always worked as an educator. So now my focus really is education. And I'm enjoying that very much because we do need more informatics nurses in our field. We need the nurses with the passion. And I heard that word earlier today um, describing um, our co-speakers. One does need to have the passion to say, I'm excited about data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. All nurses need to have competencies related to nursing informatics. So whether or not you are an informatics nurse, we all of us are moving toward competencies that are needed in the field of nursing informatics. So today I'd like to briefly discuss thinking about creating a professional development plan for you. So most of you now are students in a program and you're probably thinking, oh, I have a year till I graduate. I have two years till I graduate. I'd like you to think beyond, think beyond that end of your current education. And where are you gonna go after that? So some of this may be future, but do think about the future and where you are headed. So thinking, think about a professional development plan for yourself. I also want to talk about the importance of professional certification, why we should be certified, and then identify educational preparation for several certifications. There is a certification in nursing informatics, but you may be uh, interested in a different or an additional certification as well. So first, I want to talk a little bit about professional development. I couldn't figure out whether I should call this professional development or lifelong learning. Uh, in the US, we have a nursing informatics scope and standards of professional practice. And one of our obligations, one of our standards of practice is that we do engage in lifelong learning. And it almost seems funny to say that, but I have heard people say, well, I, I I'm retiring in eight years and I don't need to learn anything more. And I'm thinking, no, I do not want this type of person to be my nurse because we know that technology is changing. We know that healthcare is changing. So we want to change along with this. And so we do need some additional learning. So we have formal education, we have continuing education and certification are some things that I'd like to talk about. So with professional development, why do we do this? We do this to increase our motivation. We develop our nursing abilities and we advance our career. So if you're thinking about creating a development plan, you might include things like increasing your technology skills or getting certifications or improving your efficiency finding a mentor, continuing education on your own. So these are some of the items that may it be included in your uh, lifelong learning plan. Certification, um, certification demonstrates specialty expertise and valids, validates knowledge to employees and patients. All right, so in, the, in thinking about formal education, you might have a bachelor's degree. It seems that a number of you on this call are working toward your bachelor's degree. It might be in a clinical area such as nursing, or it might be in health information management. And whatever degree you have or are attaining, there's always a higher degree. So always think about the higher one when you make your professional personal plan. At this time, I do not know of any bachelor's degrees in nursing informatics, but you have a bachelor's in nursing and then can follow on with specialized classes in informatics or move on to take a master's degree 
in informatics or other, other fields, or a postmaster's degree. You might get a certificate in informatics. There is a degree called the DNP, the Doctorate of Nursing Practice. Some programs do focus on informatics. And then the Doctor of Philosophy degree, there are programs too that focus in nursing informatics. So we have many educational opportunities for combining informatics in our field of nursing. Where can you get continuing education? Well, schools of nursing. So even once you graduate, your school of nursing will be offering continuing education programs that you can take advantage of in many areas, but hopefully informatics as well. Dr. Natasha talked about HIMSS. I know that uh, Dr. Vicki Tiazzi is a member. I'm a life lifelong member of HIMSS. I've been a mem member of HIMSS for probably 25 years now. It's an organization that um, I volunteered uh, many activities in my career in HIMSS, but I get back more than I volunteer. So I was just thrilled to hear about the complimentary one-year membership. Do take advantage of that. Please do. So not only is there a International Hymns Organization based out of Chicago, Illinois. We do have the Hymns Middle East community, so please look at that website. Uh, also, there is an Emirates Health Informatics Society, and the URL is listed here. Sigma, which is the International Nursing Honor Society, has uh, a does not have a chapter in UAE to my knowledge, but there is a virtual chapter. So when you get to the point where it's appropriate for you to join an honor society, look for that virtual chapter. And actually I'm quite excited about that because I helped start it a number of years ago. So countries that do not have a chapter, or if you live somewhere that does not have a chapter, then there is a virtual one and they are quite active. I'm very impressed. They have inductions. They have webinars. Uh, the Sigma International Convention was just held in Indianapolis, Indiana this last week. And there was actually a physical meeting of the chapter of virtual leaders. Then there is something called the Nursing Informatics Bootcamp. That is what I created a number of years ago. And um, I'll give this shameless plug for that. And of course, there's other continuing education opportunities, but I just wanted to highlight a few. All right, so why even bother to be certified? Why is this important? Okay, you might have or are attaining your bachelor's degree in nursing, and that is wonderful. But on top of this degree, you might think about certification which could be a stamp of approval on what you do already. Um, here are some of the reasons why people said they sought certification. And this came from a survey conducted by HIMSS members and was presented at a convention in 2016. And it still holds true today. So you might be certified because that's a competitive advantage over other job applicants. So I've been, uh, at, actually it was at a nursing and informatics boot camp where two nurses had a master's degree and in informatics and they were both vying for a job. And one person, the one person that was certified in nursing informatics thought that's what put her over the edge that her, allowed her to get that job. It can enhance your confidence in your abilities it can enhance your credibility and marketability. Patients can look at that and say, well, my nurse is certified in nursing informatics or other areas. It's possible that you might get increased compensation. Maybe not, not a lot, but I have heard some cases where people do get a promotion as a res result of being certified in nursing informatics. And a lot of times we do it for personal satisfaction. 
So these are some of the reasons to get certified in nursing informatics or other areas. All right, so I want to talk about some of the certifications that are available to us. And there are others, of course. There's many certifications available in healthcare and healthcare informatics. So I want to discuss a couple of them that are appropriate for this field. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one. So you might think about uh, the future and what certification might be right for you. So I'll briefly talk about eligibility requirements, topics and costs for each of these certifications. And then you will have references at the end so you can explore any of them that interest you. So of course, I always promote nursing informatics certification for nurses. And there is one certification, and that is ANCC, that happens to be the American Nurses Credentialing Center. International nurses can take it as well. So it used to be just focused on the US. And now, actually, anyone in any country that is close to a prometric center can be certified in nursing informatics. So I will talk about these just, just a little bit. Okay, AMCC Nursing Informatics. Again, that's the American Nurses Credentialing Center. It is a subsidiary of the ANA, the American Nurses Association. So on the left-hand side are the requirements for being certified in nursing informatics. You do need to be a nurse, that makes sense. You can um, be a nurse outside of the US as well. And as I mentioned, that is a newer um, experience. So we are happy to invite nurses from other countries to apply. Um, you do need to be have a bachelor's degree in nursing or a higher degree in nursing. And it can be also in a, a related field. So it could be something like education. You do have to have practiced as a nurse, and that makes sense because I think to be a good informatics nurse, you have to have some experience in nursing. That seems funny to say, but some people think they can uh, leave school, uh, come out of school, and immediately function as an informatics nurse. And I think it's better to have a little bit of experience under your belt first, and ANCC agrees. You do need continuing education, and I already mentioned how continuing education is so important. So what they require is 30 hours of continuing education within the last three years. And there is a practice hour requirement. So you have to work the equivalent of one full-time year over the last three years. The topics that are part of the certification are listed here. So the main topics are foundations of practice, system design lifecycle, and data management and health, um, health IT. So the subtopics are listed here. And coincidentally, when I conduct the nursing informatics boot camp, these are the topics we discuss. Uh, we follow the scope and standards of nursing informatics practice, which is a very good document, a very good um, document on which to base our practice. I think it's now just maybe available electronically, but there is actually a hard copy book that is available. And so, for example, foundations of practice includes professional practice, models and theories, rules, regulations, and requirements, the system life cycle. We talk about that. And remember, too, that's not just the nursing system life cycle. It's a life cycle that every uh, professional um, can utilize in thinking about implementing systems or designing systems or um, evaluating systems. And then we talk about data management, and that includes things like data standards, data management, data transformation, as well as hardware, software, and peripherals. There is a charge for taking this exam. If you are a member of the American Nurses Association, that's 270 US dollars. If you're an, a member of ANEA, which is a uh, nursing informatics group, primarily based in the US, oh, which I founded 30 some years ago, 
then there is a discount for that. If you're a non-member, it's 395 US dollars. And the certification is valid, valid for five years, and then you need to be recertified. And one thing to think about when you are getting uh, certified in any area, what is the burden or what is the requirement for recertification? So that's something to think about. And the recertification involves some practice. It involves um, a lot of continuing our education hours, or which what's really nice about recertification for ANCC, there's other activities you can do that count toward recertification. And that's things like mentoring other nurses and writing articles and speaking at conferences. That all counts. Okay, so I talked about the Nursing Informatics Bootcamp. It's something I'm quite proud of. And in uh, just two years ago, it was an in-person course. Um, it is a two-day course. It focuses on current informatics trends and issues in healthcare. And those nurses who are interested in becoming certified um, often take this course to uh, validate the knowledge they already know and perhaps learn some new things that they didn't, may not have learned in school. So I've conducted 139 courses in the US and I went to Qatar. Very excited about that. The courses now are virtual and you know why, but I also do in-person courses. So hopefully in the future, in fact, right before COVID hit, I had, uh, I was working with a vendor to actually conduct the course in, um, in UAE, Kuwait and Qatar. And you know what happened to that idea. So now they're vir virtual, not quite as much fun, but almost as good. So hospitals host the Nursing Informatics Bootcamp. Kim's chapters have hosted the Nursing Informatics Bootcamp. In fact, tomorrow and the next day, I will be um, conducting a bootcamp hosted by the Iowa Hymns chapter. Schools of nursing have, have hosted the bootcamp and vendors have hosted the boot, boot camp as well. So hopefully someday you will have a chance to experience a course like this. Love to have you. And I just thought I'd throw in a picture. This was one of my boot camps hosted by a Hymns chapter, the Central and North Florida chapter in Florida. And I didn't know whether to show that picture or the great food we had. All right, now there is a, there are other certifications besides the ANCC Nursing Informatics Certification. So HIMS offers two certifications. One is called CA HIMS. The, the next one on the next slide is CP HIMS. So CA HIMS stands for Certified Association I'm sorry, Certified Associate in Healthcare Information and Management Systems. So that's the CA HIMSS. There is a candidate handbook available on the web. The latest one was um, April of 2021, this year, and it is available free online. So I have the topics listed here, uh, the Healthcare and Technology Environments, Clinical Informatics, healthcare information and systems management, management and leadership. Those are the high level topics, but you can look online and see what the uh, detail of each of those topics are. And that would help you decide, do you wanna be certified um, but, and have a CA hymns after your name. Testing is with per, uh, Pearson View. That's where you have to go to take the test and they, the test is um, 150 multiple choice questions. You have two hours to take that. There is a cost. So you can see on the right hand side how much it is in US dollars. Um, and let's say you are certified for three years. So with this CA HIMS, you do not need a bachelor's degree. You can have, um, you need to have a high school diploma and at least 45 hours of experience. So some of you might even be qualified now. Now, for those with more um, experience, more time in the field of healthcare informatics, there is CP HIMS. All right, and people put CP HIMS after their name if they're certified in this arena. 
Okay, um, so this is the advanced professional. You do have to have a bachelor's degree or a degree um, in information management. You have to have 10 years of experience and eight of that has to be in healthcare. So 10 years of in information and management experience with eight in healthcare. All right, the topics are listed here. Also, there is a detailed outline on the HIMSS site and the costs of these certifications are listed here as well. Let's see, this certification is um, after three years, so you do have to renew. Now there is another certification and some of our colleagues in healthcare informatics have this certification. It used to be called Information Technology Infrastructure Library. So that's what that ITIL is. And it is now in the fourth version. Um, there is an exam, a 60 minute exam that's administered at the Prometric site. Or now, because of COVID, you can take uh, some of these exams virtually, which must be an interesting experience. The topics are listed here. So this looks to me like it's a little bit more technical. Um, so you study things like lean, agile, um, things that are a little bit more technical. And some of you may have come into, you know, I heard Dr. Natasha say she came into nursing as a second career. Some of you may be in nursing as a second career and perhaps have some information processing, information management background. And this might be an exam that you might be interested in um, taking. The cost is listed. There's always a cost. Then project management. A lot of what we do in nursing informatics is project management. And many nurses undertake project management without having traditional training. So if you think about getting traditional training, one option is through the Project Management Institute. And then there are exams that follow this training. So one of the certifications they offer is PMP. That's, that is for project management. You need a four-year degree. You need um, three years of lead, leading projects and 35 hours of project management education or training. You do need a high school diploma. Um, let's see, or a high school diploma, 60 months leading projects and 35 hours of project management. So the exam content is listed. Um, as it says here, the higher levels are people, process, and business environment. It does cost money to take this exam, and those costs are listed here. Now, there is a newer exam sponsored by AMIA, American Medical Informatics Association, and it can be taken outside of the U.S. as well. This is um, a higher, what they propose, the exam has not yet been given, but it will be given very soon. But they propose it is a higher level than the Nursing Informatics ANCC certification. And one of the clues is that a master's degree or doctor, doctoral degree in health informatics is required. The topics are listed here. Foundational knowledge, enhancing health decision-making processes and outcomes data governance, management and analytics, leadership, professional strategy, professionalism, strategy and transformation. And there is a cost for taking the exam. It varies if you're a member of AMIA or not. And then they do have uh, advertised their fee if you need to retake the exam. Let's hope that doesn't happen. All right. Couple others, a National Association for Healthcare Quality. And the requirements are interesting. They don't require a specific degree, but you need to self assess your readiness to take the exam. And they suggest that you have two years of experience. The topics are listed organizational leadership, health data analytics, performance and process improvement, patient safety, and the costs are listed. So this sort of points out to another sub area within nursing informatics, and that could be quality. Just a couple more. There is an organization called AHIMA, which 
used to be more the medical records group and your focus, your career path might take you to more of a medical records approach. And it tells you here what the requirements are. So you have to have an accredited, complete an accredited program, graduate from an HIM program approved by a foreign association with which AMIA, I'm sorry, HEMA has a re reciprocity agreement. So that means people outside of the US can take it as well. The topics are listed, information government, governance, compliance with uses and disclosures of PHI, data analytics and informatics, revenue management and leadership management. And there is a price, uh, there is a cost for taking this. So you would have the letters RHIA after your name, then there is another AHIMA certification. And this one is Certified Documentation Improvement Practitioner. And I think someone now who is looking at the documentation burden of nurses might be interested in a um, certification such as this. I'll just let you read it and you will have the slides available to you as well. Okay, so just a little um, closing thought. I would advise you to work with someone, a mentor, work with an advisor at your school. If you are currently working, work with a manager at your facility. Um, set goals for yourself. Okay, your immediate goal might be finishing your bachelor's degree. That's wonderful. But what are you going to do after that? Where are you headed after that? You also need to have goal setting with your family because your ha family has to be on board. If you're going to go down the path of education and start working on your master's degree right away, working maybe toward a DMP or a PhD, your family has to be on board with this as well. And find someone to study with, find someone to work with, find, um, in, in my career, I had a, um, several nursing mentors. Um, I also had a very good friend that I was working with. She became a good friend and she had a master's degree. And I thought she was such a wonderful nurse. And here she had a master's degree. I better get one too. And then she moved on and got a PhD. And then lo and behold, I thought, I want to be like Roxy. I need to get my PhD. So she helped me through that process. So it is, um, it's teamwork. And here's just some final thoughts on um, keeping on track. And if you have questions, I will read the question box and the chat. And uh, thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Dr. Newbold, for your enlightening uh, lecture and walking us through the different certification and professional development uh, initiatives and programs uh, that will help our audience. Uh, I would like to call Dr. Natasha and you, Dr. Newbold, to join us in sharing uh, one of the questions that the audience has posted onto the chat and that you feel you would like to share it to the whole group, or if you would like to have a final remark, a final message to the students. So Dr. Ramantel, we'll start with you. Sure, so um, I did go into the chat and I saw a question, I'm trying to scroll back, very interesting question pertaining to um, not knowing where informatics was going. Someone was quite nervous about uh, where nursing informatics was going in the future. And uh, my response to that is, you know, technology continues to advance every day and it is being incorporated in the healthcare setting more and more. So I believe that nursing informatics and digital health are growing exponentially. So there's um, enormous opportunity and as other um, panelists here have shared, there are a number of subspecialties even within nursing informatics and digital health. So there's a lot of diversity there as well. I don't think that nursing informatics or digital health is going away. I think it will become more and more advanced. So um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for people to get involved and determine where what interests them and pursue that, whether it's with additional education, certifications, professional certifications, that's the way to go. 
Thank you, Dr. Ramantola. I totally agree with you. The fast and rapid changes in healthcare and moving toward digitalization, moving toward technology-enabled organization and data-driven organization truly adds an emphasis into this specialty. And it's also cascading down to the lower levels, to the bedside nurses, to the clinical nurses, where they have to have a certain amount of and competency and knowledge about this area. Th yes. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, and today we are happy to have you with us. My Dr. pleasure, Newbold. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Newbold, please go ahead. Informatics certainly is a great career. Our roles have changed. So early on, we were super users, we were implementers, we might evaluate systems. So over time, a lot of our organizations have systems. They may have the second generation of electronic health records. So our role has changed. Maybe instead of implementing, we're working more toward optimizing systems or data analytics. That's a field that informatics nurses, um, as Dr. Tiaze had mentioned, um, are in now and are moving towards. So our roles do change. And in thinking about roles and titles, somebody said something about titles. There are thousands of titles related to informatics. That's one of our issues. That's one of our problems. So we can't just say we're the informatics nurse or the informatics nurse specialist. We have many roles that might be under the umbrella of nursing informatics. So that could be roles in telehealth. That could be roles in genetics and genomics. That could be roles in analytics. So there, there could be something for everyone related to informatics. And again, that's not to say that every nurse needs to be an informatics nurse but um, every nurse needs to have competencies related to nursing informatics. Totally agree, Dr. Newbold. And we need really our uh, educational program and professional development program to bring that insights and to bring those competencies up. So we as nurses and as a nurse informatics can continue the path and uh, enhance and advance this uh, profession. Thank you very much for both of our uh, speakers for session two for your uh, sharing your experience and joining us. We are truly honored to your present with us today. Now I would like to ask our uh, audience uh, to go through the same uh, pre-workshop poll which we did initially. The aim here is that uh, we went now through all the session and we learned a lot of our, from our prestigious speakers. And we, uh, they touch a, a very vital information and brought a great insight to us. So uh, let's have that uh, activity again and, and see where do we stand uh, from our knowledge level. Again, this is anonymous. It's not a test. It's just to see where do we stand and plan our future uh, initiatives and programs. So you have five uh, minutes to answer the poll. Thank you.
Thanks for you all from Emirates Health Services. On behalf of Dr. Sumaya Mohamed Leblouchi, Director of Nursing, Emirates Health Services, and the head of the National Committee for Nursing and Midwifery, we would like to appreciate, first of all, Gulf Medical University and the amazing team for their collaboration with us and support for the conduction of this webinar. Our utmost appreciation to our prestigious international speakers who took a time from their uh, daily schedule and joined us and shared their passionate experience and their view into the nursing informatics and digital health. Our appreciation to the academic institution, to the nursing students for joining this webinar. This will be one of many to come and we wish you all the best. And we hope that we have delivered a beneficial insight into this specialization that will help you moving forward. You are our future nurses, our future agents of a change. So good luck and enjoy the remaining of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will